1943, Japan's skies were filled with radial engines thundering through combat. But in Kawasaki's factories, engineers bet everything on a different sound. The smooth purr of an inline engine that would revolutionize their fighters. The HA-140 promised to be Japan's answer to the Merlin and DB-601. Instead, it became an engineering nightmare that grounded entire squadrons and nearly destroyed Japan's fighter production. Yet from its ashes rose the Ki-100, perhaps the best Japanese fighter nobody talks about. As the Pacific War intensified, Japan faced a brutal reality. American fighters were getting faster, flying higher and dominating the skies with powerful inline engines that gave them sleek profiles and devastating performance. The Imperial Japanese Army Air Force watched enviously as their Navy counterparts fielded the excellent Zero. But Army fighters like the Ki-43 Hayabusa, despite their agility, were woefully underpowered. Japan needed speed, altitude performance, and the kind of raw power that only liquid-cooled inline engines could deliver. The pressure was mounting. B-25 Super Fortresses were coming, and Japan's radial engine fighters couldn't reach them. Kawasaki stepped forward with a bold promise. They would build Japan's most powerful inline engine and mount it in a fighter that could save the homeland. What followed was a story of ambition, catastrophe, and unexpected redemption. The HA-140 wasn't just another engine. It was Kawasaki's declaration that Japan could master the inline game. Based loosely on the German DB-601A, this inverted V-12 monster displaced 33.9 liters and promised over 1,175 horsepower at altitude. Twelve cylinders arranged in an inverted V configuration, liquid-cooled with precision engineering that represented the pinnacle of Japanese manufacturing ambition. When it ran properly, the HA-140 sang a mechanical symphony unlike anything in Japan's arsenal, a smooth, powerful hum that contrasted sharply with the rough bark of radial engines. It powered the Ki-61 Hien, known to Allied pilots as Tony, the only mass-produced Japanese fighter with an inline engine. In theory, it was everything Japan needed, a high-altitude interceptor with the speed to catch B-29s, the power to climb rapidly, and a streamlined design to slice through the air like a katana. Engineers at Kawasaki's Akashi plant spoke of it with reverence, calling it the heart that would pump new life into Japan's fighter force. The engine featured fuel injection rather than carburetors, a sophisticated feature for its time that promised better altitude performance and fuel efficiency. Its supercharger was designed to maintain power up to 20,000 feet, where American bombers were beginning to operate with impunity. The crankshaft alone was a marvel of engineering, forged from special steel alloys that pushed Japanese metallurgy to its limits. Each HA-140 required over 2,000 man-hours to build, compared to just 800 for a typical radial engine. This complexity would prove to be both its greatest strength and fatal weakness. But the HA-140's development was cursed from the start. While Kawasaki had licensed the DB-601 design from Germany, they faced an immediate problem. Japan's manufacturing tolerances and metallurgy weren't up to German standards. The engine required precision that pushed Japanese machine tools beyond their limits. Early prototypes suffered from chronic overheating, oil leaks, and catastrophic bearing failures. Test pilots reported engines seizing mid-flight, forcing dangerous dead stick landings. The complexity was staggering. Where a radial engine was forgiving and could run even when damaged, the HA-140 demanded perfection. Every component had to mesh precisely. Every tolerance had to be exact. Factory workers, accustomed to building robust radial engines, struggled with the HA-140's delicate nature. Quality control became a nightmare as Kawasaki raced against time. With American bombers appearing over Japan in ever-increasing numbers, the engineering team worked 18-hour days, sleeping in the factory, desperately trying to solve each crisis as it emerged. Some engineers later admitted that they knew they were attempting the impossible, building a Formula One engine with bicycle shop tools. By late 1943, the problems were so severe that entire Ki-61 squadrons were grounded, their beautiful inline fighters sitting useless on airfields while mechanics attempted repairs they barely understood. If you're into stories of innovation under fire, subscribe now. We've got more legends to uncover. Despite its problems, when the HA-140 worked, it transformed the Ki-61 into a formidable opponent. Pilots who managed to get reliable engines spoke of the he and with all. Captain Turahiko Kobayashi, an ace with the 244th Sentai, described the feeling. When the engine ran true, the he and was poetry in motion. We could reach altitudes the Americans thought were safe, diving on B-24s with speed they couldn't match. The inline engine gave the Ki-61 a top speed of 368 miles per hour, faster than most Japanese fighters, and competitive with American P-40s and early P-47s. In the skies over New Guinea and the Philippines, Ki-61s with functioning engines proved devastating. Their sleek profile often confused American pilots who initially mistook them for German Bf-109s. 
The 68th and 78th Sentais, operating from Rabaul, achieved remarkable success rates when their engines held together. One memorable engagement saw 12 Ki-61 successfully break up a formation of B-24 Liberators, downing three bombers and damaging five more, a feat impossible for slower Japanese fighters. But these victories came at a price. For every Ki-61 that scored in combat, two more sat in maintenance hangars with blowed engines. The Ki-61's finest hour came during the fence of Rabaul in late 1943, when P-38 Lightnings escorted B-25 medium bombers on a daylight raid. The 68th Sentai's Ki-61s climbed to 25,000 feet, an altitude where most Japanese fighters struggled to maintain control. The Heans dove through the escort screen with their engines screaming at maximum power, achieving speeds over 450 miles per hour in their attacking dives. They claimed eight bombers and three fighters for the loss of only two Ki-61s. American intelligence officers studying the wreckage of downed Ki-61s were shocked to find liquid-cooled inline engines. They'd assumed Japan lacked the technology to produce such power plants. These combat successes, however spectacular, couldn't mask the HA-140's fundamental unreliability that would soon bring the entire program crashing down. Then came January 19, 1945, a date that would live in infamy for Kawasaki. The truth that engineers had tried to hide finally exploded into catastrophe. A B-29 raid targeted the Akashi engine plant where HA-140 production was centered. But the shocking truth wasn't the bombing itself. It's what investigators discovered in the aftermath. Quality control documents hidden in a damaged safe revealed that Kawasaki had been knowingly installing defective engines for months. The pressure to meet production quotas had led to a devil's bargain. Engines that failed testing were marked as provisional passes and shipped to combat units anyway. Internal memos showed engineers calculating that it was better to have fighters with unreliable engines than no fighters at all. The bombing destroyed not just the factory but the entire HA-140 production line, tooling, and the experienced workforce. In one night, Japan's inline engine program effectively died. Hundreds of Ki-61 airframes sat engineless at Kawasaki's Kagamigahara plant. Beautiful fighters rendered useless. The Army Air Force faced a crisis. Japan's only inline fighter was now extinct enemy bombers roamed freely at altitudes radial engine fighters couldn't reach. The true extent of the disaster went deeper than mere production loss. Post-war analysis revealed that of the 3,159 Ki-61s built, nearly 40% never saw combat due to engine failures. Maintenance units reported that HA-140 engines rarely exceeded 100 hours of operation before requiring complete overhaul, compared to 300 to 400 hours for American inline engines. The chronic shortage of specialized tools and replacement parts meant that even minor problems often grounded aircrafts permanently. One maintenance officer's diary, discovered years later, contained a telling entry. We have become undertakers, not mechanics. We bury more engines than we fix. The HA-140 program had consumed vast resources, steel, aluminum, and skilled workers that Japan desperately needed elsewhere. It was a technological gamble that had failed catastrophically leaving Japan's home defense in shambles just as the B-29 offensive reached its crescendo. But from this disaster came an inspiration born of desperation. Chief Engineer Takeo Doi looked at the engineless Ki-61 airframes and had a radical idea. What if they installed a radial engine instead? It seemed insane, like putting a truck engine in a Ferrari. The Ki-61 was designed around the slim inline engine. A radio would destroy its aerodynamics, but Doi persisted using the Mitsubishi HA-112-2 radial, a reliable 1500 horsepower engine used in the Army's bombers. Working with impossible deadlines, engineers performed miracles. They redesigned the cowling, shifted the center of gravity, and somehow made it work. The first converted fighter, designated Ki-100, took to the skies in February 1945. Test pilot Lieutenant Yohei Hinoki couldn't believe what he was flying. He climbed like a rocket, turned like a zero, and dove like a thunderbolt, he reported. The ugly duckling had become a swan. The Ki-100 retained the Ki-61's excellent high-altitude performance while gaining the reliability Japanese pilots desperately needed. In its first combat engagement, Ki-100s from the 5th Sentai intercepted B-29s over Tokyo, downing two super fortresses, a feat that even the troublesome Ki-61 rarely achieved. American pilots who encountered the Ki-100 reported it as the most dangerous Japanese fighter they faced in 1945. The conversation process itself was a masterpiece of improvisation. Engineers had just six weeks to solve the countless problems. The radial engine was 200 pounds heavier than the inline, requiring ballast adjustments and control surface modifications. The wider cowling should have ruined the plane's speed, but clever aerodynamic fixes actually improved handling characteristics. They designed a unique cooling system that used the radial's airflow more efficiently than traditional designs. Most remarkably, 
The KI-100's performance exceeded the original KI-61 in several crucial areas, climbed faster, turned tighter, and maintained control at extreme altitudes. American technical intelligence officers who examined captured KI-100s after the war were astonished. One report noted, This conversion represents perhaps the most successful emergency redesign in aviation history. That it was accomplished under bombardment with minimal resources defies conventional engineering wisdom. By war's end, only 396 KI-100s had been built, a fraction of what Japan needed. Yet veterans who flew it universally praised the fighter as Japan's best. The irony was complete. Kawasaki's greatest fighter emerged not from their advanced inline engine program, but from its complete failure. The HA-140 disaster had forced innovation that might never have occurred otherwise. Today, only three KI-100 survive in museums, but their story resonates. Aviation historians point to the HA-140 saga as a cautionary tale about the dangers of overreaching technology. The Japanese had tried to leap from reliable simplicity to cutting-edge complexity without the industrial base to support it. Yet the KI-100 proved that constraints could breed brilliance. At air shows, when warbird enthusiasts see a radial-engined KI-100, few know they're looking at a fighter born from catastrophe, a machine that should never have existed but became a legend. Post-war American evaluation flights confirmed what Japanese pilots had claimed. The KI-100 could outturn a P-51D Mustang, outclimb a P-47 Thunderbolt, and match the speed of late-model Spitfires. Colonel Frank McCoy, who tested a captured KI-100 in 1946, wrote, Had this aircraft been available in numbers from 1943, Pacific Air War would have been a very different story. The tragedy was that Japan possessed the airframe design expertise all along. It was their obsession with watching Western inline engine technology that nearly destroyed their fighter force. Modern aviation engineers study the KI-100 as a case study in an adaptive design. Boeing engineers referenced the KI-100 conversion when developing modular engine concepts for modern aircraft. The lesson was clear. Sometimes the best solution isn't the most advanced, but the most practical. In the end, the HA-140's greatest contribution to aviation history was its failure, a failure that sparked innovation and created an unlikely masterpiece. The HA-140 story teaches us that failure and success are often intertwined in ways we never expect. Kawasaki's engineers reached for perfection and grasped disaster, Yet from that disaster emerged something remarkable. In war, as in engineering, the perfect can become the enemy of the good. The KI-100 stands as proof that innovation doesn't always mean complexity. Sometimes it means finding simple solutions to impossible problems. The roar of its radial engine carries a deeper message. The human ingenuity shines brightest not when everything goes right, but when everything goes wrong and we refuse to surrender. True engineering legends aren't just built in laboratories and test stands. They're forged in the crucible of crisis. Tempered by failure, they remembered not for what was planned, but for what was achieved against all odds. The HA-140 saga reminds us that technological ambition must be balanced with industrial reality. Japan's engineers weren't wrong to pursue inline engine technology, they were simply premature. Their failure became a catalyst for one of aviation's most inspiring comeback stories. In our modern age of complex systems and cutting-edge technology, the KI-100 whispers a timeless truth. Sometimes stepping back leads to the greatest leap forward. If you love this story of disaster turned triumph, drop a like and subscribe. What engine should we cover next? Let us know in the comments, and remember, every legendary machine has a story. Make sure you're subscribed to hear them all.